Today is August 29th, 1997. We're in Columbus, Ohio. The 12th Armored Division. My name is Jake Fortenberry, and this is Rita Winter. Um, Ma'am, could you tell us a little bit about your childhood, what your parents did and growing up, and what it was like growing up in the Depression? Well, <clears throat> I was uh, born in Pomona, California, and um, went to uh, school and everything right there in Monrovia. And uh, uh, my father worked in Los Angeles at uh, a big bakery. Uh, didn't really make a lot of money in those days, but it just, we kids didn't even pay any attention to that. We didn't know anything different and, and just had a lovely, happy family. And I come from a family of uh, three of us girls and a brother. And, uh, and I went to, uh, we went to church in town there and was very active, and that was where, uh, within the area, uh, Jack attended, and we met each other, and um, we had seen each other uh, very few times, and uh, they were having a big church party at a park, and having picnic and everything, and his father and mother come there, I had met the mother, but I had never really met the father and, at all. And I was only about 10 years old, and we, um, he come over and he says, I want you to meet somebody over here. So I went over to where he was taking me, and he says, I want to introduce you to my mother and father. And I see he was only about like uh, 11 or 12, and I was 10, and he says, Mom, and Dad, this is a girl I'm going to marry someday. Well, I was surprised at that, too, but I guess we had fallen in love very, very early. But we uh, went our different ways for some years. And <clears throat> then when high school, I graduated in 42. He had graduated, a, I believe, about a year before. And uh, we had... Uh, dated a lot. We had a lot of dances in our church, and they were, in those days, a long formal with corsages and uh, little dance cards and really nice, nice dances. So uh, we went to many of those and um, always, always had fun together and enjoyed ourselves. Then time, time, the time come when war was getting started. <coughs> And uh, we were about the same thing as engaged. And so um, we, uh, um, I remember I worked at a defense plant down in Santa Monica, Douglas Aircraft. And I was down there, then he was in the service, and he'd come down there and meet me. Then we'd go on up to Monrovia on the, uh, this is the streetcar days, which they don't even exist anymore. And we would stay up there. He'd go to his folks's, and I'd go to my folks's, and uh, enjoyed all the visits when he was out at the army camp. So then, when um, we had decided to get married in November of '93, no. 43. I graduated high school 42 and got married in uh, 43. And um, so that's, but I do remember the time that he was leaving and I would go to the Los Angeles airport or a train depot with him. And that was awfully hard to say goodbye to a boyfriend. And we knew war was coming on. And this war was really an action war. We knew that the defense plants were really busy and and um, so in, we did get married in um, Mesa, Arizona, in uh, November of uh, uh, 43. And um, we did not go to, uh, I did not go with him immediately. Um, I had to wait until he found a place uh, in Las Cruces, New Mexico, and we were there for a length of time. And, um, it was then he was shipped over to uh, uh, Abilene, and I uh, remember going over there, and 
was there several months, and it is, wasn't easy. The, we got a, this little old apartment way out by the garage. It uh, was just wide enough that when we put the, our bed, which was a couch, out, it hit from wall to wall, and the, in the corner there was a toilet, and there was just a screen around it, and um, everything was really different. And the only way that we were even able to get that apartment was I had to work for the lady that owned this whole property. In those days, the material in the men's shirts, which she had a husband that was in business and had to wear a shirt every single day, the son wore a white shirt too. They had to be ironed with an iron. There was no uh, a polyester material had not even been invented at that time. So I had to iron every single one of those shirts every week, which I did not appreciate at all. And um, do her housework and everything, and I don't even remember the pay. It must have been practically nothing. But I did it because I wanted to be there with my husband. And um, then it, in due time, uh, I found out I was pregnant and uh, I did not take those things very easy. I was just sick and they called an ambulance and took me to the hospital and I was in there having intravenous shots and just laying in that bed so sick I just didn't care if I lived or died and wished I would die. So uh, finally, <clears throat> in due time, they said you better just take your wife home uh, to California and um, so this is what uh, they did, and talk about being hot on the way home. They didn't have air-conditioned trains, and uh, things were not like they are these days at all. But we finally did get home, and it's a little different than um, where he used to work in the telephone company was, uh, he worked there, or at least there was a telephone company in El Monte as the train went past into Los Angeles where we were thinking we would have to go and somebody come pick us up. But as we went past this little town of El Monte, he got to remembering that there was an office there. So he went and talked to the um, conductor, I guess it was, and he says, you know, if you would let me and my wife and our luggage off right here in town, uh, it would save us a lot because he says my wife is really quite sick and we've gone a long ways from Texas clear to California. So the conductor went clear up and talked to whoever was running the train. I don't know what you'd even call him these days or then. And he says, sure, that'd be fine. Well, you can't, <laughs> in this 1997, these things would not happen. But as we come into El Monte, they stopped the whole train he got my luggage, my husband's luggage, and uh, led us off right there on the main street of El Monte. And after it pulled away, then we just went to the telephone office and they had a bed in there and uh, let me lay down. And then he called my folks and they come down there and got us. That's not like <laughs> these days, but it was really wonderful and helped us out. So uh, then he left within that week and uh, went back to uh, uh, Abilene, and uh, I guess they were sent overseas from there. And Jack and I wrote every single day during the war. He wrote to me, I wrote to him. And when we had blackouts, which we had to turn all the lights off, in the, the uh, air raid noise would go, and everybody turned all their lights off <coughs> in the house, every car that was on the street had to turn their lights off so everything was dark so that there would not be any um, I guess they were thinking a plane would come in and maybe do shooting and so they uh, this is what we did well when I wanted to write my letter I would crawl underneath the blankets and put it over top of my head or crawl underneath um, the bed with a flashlight and I would write my letter. Now all my letters <coughs> pardon me, that I sent to Jack, 
of course, had to be destroyed because uh, he had no way of keeping these and taking care of them. But I have every letter that he sent to me during the whole war in my possession now, and they're just nice. Now, these were on little pieces of paper. They called them V-mail. And after we would write the letter, it was folded up a certain way because they had red lines where you had to fold them up. And uh, never during the war time did we have to pay postage. Everything uh, had the serviceman's number on it, and we would um, put them out in the mailbox, and they all just went free. All his come to me free. And so uh, we got all these, and when Christmas come along, and Mother's Day, and, and Easter, Jack always did a lot of artwork and make them real, look real pretty, and um, that was fun to even look at them now. Then I remember when my baby was born, uh, the Red Cross always sends uh, a message to a serviceman. But I uh, also sent one, and he actually got mine before he ever even got the Red Cross's letter about our little daughter, Carol. And he uh, sent back and, and had written a nice little uh, V letter to his daughter and thought that was something. And, and I'm sure it was different for a husband being away that way. He never saw me expecting. <clears throat> he never was there for the delivery of the baby. He never saw her when she was a baby, he never saw her uh, crawling around or anything. And it was different, but he wrote lovely letters that he, of course, wished that he could have been with me. But I know it was a different feeling because uh, a husband not ever seeing a child they didn't really have that realization that that was their own little baby. But uh, she was a year old, and she was very tiny where she walked early. <clears throat> and uh, she was a year old when he came home to see her the first time. And he's always kidded that she cried every time he tried to pick her up. But at that time, there was no, sir, there was no man from 17 on up had gone into the service, Navy or Army. So there was no men. There was only grandpas and little boys that was home. She was frightened of anybody that she had never seen, that age of a, a man around that wanted to pick her up and love her, because my father was clear up uh, older, older gentleman, and that was a different thing than a young man picking her up and frightening at her. But I did live with my parents, and when uh, Jack did come home, um, <clears throat> uh, I just had waited and waited, and I had got little new outfits for Carol. I had got new outfits for me. They got old and threw those away, and I got new ones, and he still didn't come home, and I kept thinking he'd be home. So finally, one day, I washed all her cute little pajamas, and they were just cute little um, pink ones, and I uh, thought, well, we didn't have dryers in those days. We had washing machines, and you hung everything up on the line outside. <clears throat> so uh, here I had them hung up, and I had taken a sweater and pulled over her legs. I pulled another sweater that went over her arms, and she looked terrible. And I had dreamt of him coming home, and I'd run to the door with this beautiful little daughter, and she'd be in a cute little outfit, and that wasn't what the story was. He came home when he got into New York. Everyone else went and phoned their wives, but Jack didn't. He come into uh, Long Beach. If they couldn't get their wives before, they would phone their wives there, not Jack. <laughs> so he hitched hike, uh, or however he did get up to our home, and uh, <clears throat> he... Uh, just opened the door, my father was up, the rest of us were all in bed. My father was up and Jack just opens the door because that was <laughs> where I lived and walked in about scared my father to death, but uh, he was home. And so uh, they just come um, down to where my bedroom was and open the door and turn the lights on. And that was probably one of the greatest days I had in my life as my husband was home. He was safe and uh, such a thrill to 
because he had been gone for many, many months. Well, then <laughs> I said, and this is your daughter, <clears throat> wishing that she <laughs> had all these cute little pajamas on, and she did it all. She had this old sweater that was at the top that kept her warm, and then the one at the bottom. But when I did pick her up, uh, we put some cute things on her, and, and so he got acquainted with his daughter that night. But when something that exciting happens, a husband come home from overseas, uh, you just don't go to bed and remember that. The neighbors, all the lights on our place, you know, they ran to the neighbors. Jack is home and, and all the neighbors come over and my brothers and sisters all woke up and we had a party that night. And uh, it was a thrill to have uh, um, Jack home and I'll just never forget that. Um, we wrote, as I said, every single day, and I wrote so many times, it got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of letters, and to this day, it's some 50, one or two or three years, but his, his serial number is 1917, 68, 91, and I don't think I'll ever forget that because that was Jack Winter and that was his um, serial number. And um, that was what was on all the uh, dog tags that the servicemen each wore. I was the only bride uh, in the church that I belonged to. And of course, I went every Sunday. And when Carol was born, uh, I just dressed her up like she <laughs> was a million dollar little baby. And I would see her at the beginning and maybe in between, but they just passed her up and down the rows. Everybody wanted to hold this little girl that was uh, in um, the church there. And it was, oh, you, you can't believe what a mother feels like when everybody wants to see your baby and hold her. After uh, Jack did come home, we did get an apartment. And um, that was a fun thing to start off because we had never had anything except in the service, and they weren't really called much like apartments, nice, or I didn't have any of my wedding things out or anything, so that was fun to be able to start off um, with the things that I we had gotten in the, when I we got married. Now, I just got to thinking, backing up a ways, when uh, we planned to get married, he was in school in um, Las Cruces, New Mexico. And um, my folks put on a really nice uh, re reception there. And it was different because we weren't married yet, but I was leaving home and that is, was a uh, etiquette thing that you could have a reception type of a thing. They didn't call it reception, but a, I forget what it was, but anyhow, they give you a reception with all the party and the refreshments and, and um, you open your gifts up. But we were not married yet. Then they, we put those away and then I went to uh, where he was in Las Cruces, New Mexico. <coughs> uh, and we got married down there. So um, we had these uh, parties. So I had never used any of my stuff. We had not we had opened them, but see, he did not even see any of our wedding gifts because he was down going to school in Las Cruces, New Mexico. So it was fun to be able to get an apartment and start off with our uh, um, wedding things. And um, after uh, we uh, did that, then we built a home later on, uh, got a home in Las, uh, La Habra, and um, then he thought, well, he had done, helped do a lot of building. Uh, the Mormon church uh, did a lot of their buildings, and he knew quite a bit about construction. So we um, built a home in um, Brea, I guess it was, and built a big home there. And then we built another one up where we are now, we, after he retired, decided we didn't want to live down in the Los Angeles area with all the smog and three other million people. So uh, we took off and went to Northern California. And uh, I can, um, 
I can tell you. <laughs> you get my voice in this. I sent a telegram to your dad. Oh, when I don't know if the young people do it these days or not. If a young man wants to marry a girl, um, that they will go to your father and say, "It's okay, okay." Jack uh, went off and uh, had this little special meeting with my father, and and um, my father says, "Jack, I think that's just great." We just think the world of you, and we wouldn't want anyone else to marry our daughter, Rita. So he said, that's just great. But he says, let me tell you, I've kept her for all these 19 years, and you want to just take her over and uh, have her for your bride. And he says, I think, truthfully, that she's probably worth a quarter. Well, I didn't even know about that. So when we got married in Arizona, um, we got married, I think, in the morning, and and uh, I had this beautiful white wedding gown on and everything. And uh, later on, he says, we got to go downtown. And I said, well, I don't know, we go have a picture taken or something, I don't know. We got down there, he says, I've got to go to the post office. And I thought to myself, no one had ever told me that that was part of getting married. You got married, and then you go to the post office. I thought, what what's happening here? So we went there, and he says, uh, I want to uh, send a money order to your father. And I thought, oh, dear, what's this? I, don't, I didn't understand. So finally he, he uh, paid, um, I think it was it cost him about like $2 to uh, mail off a 25-cent money order in the payment of one daughter, Rita Lucille <laughs> Whitlock. And um, my father has been uh, dead here for several years, and I just now have gotten one of his uh, scrapbooks. And in there is, he never did return that back to the post office and turn it back in like he could. That was something he kept all his life, and I now have uh, the receipt of a 25 cent money order in payment of one daughter. <laughs> so, uh, We've been married for, in November the 2nd, this year, it'll be 54 years. And uh, I've just been really proud of Jack. And in the first place, all the time he was a service man or boy, I was proud that he went in the service, he volunteered, he went, and we both understood that uh, that was something that the young men should do, and I was proud to be a bride of a soldier. Um, what do you remember about Camp Barkley and Abilene when you were living there, besides your apartment? What do you remember about Abilene? Well, the only way, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, I th when I think of that, I think of walking and walking and walking on the dirty streets. The only way that we could uh, get an apartment was, or I could see him. Uh, were you at school there? No, he wasn't at school there. That was Las Cruces. Well, I'll jump back. When he's at Las Cruces, the only way I could see him while he was there at all, Las Cruces, New Mexico, was that I had to get a job at the school. And uh, that was fine, except the distance from my apartment was, I say, a good mile or maybe a couple miles. He says it wasn't that far, but when I had to walk it every morning and every afternoon or evening, it was a long way, so I did do a lot of walking. But in Abilene, uh, I just remember of ironing all those white shirts and, and doing that just be, so that I could be with him. That's what I wanted, and I think that's very important for uh, couples to be able to be together. And um, I know we went to church together. We went to everything, and and uh, I don't remember if there was buses or anything, but I sure know that I uh, walked with my high heels for miles and miles, and I'd take them and I'd walk in my <laughs> my nylons, which probably were silk hose at that time. But we were together, 
And I think that was the thing that we were happy about. You got any questions for me? Anything else you can think of? You what? Anything else you can think of, ma'am? I don't. You think of anything? <laughs> what the snake in Abilene? You know, you go through all kinds of experiences. We did not have cars in those days. And so we used the buses, and uh, we would go to town. We'd come back, and, and um, so I remember stepping off the bus one day and stepping right in the middle of a snake, and he'd come up on both sides of my legs and just about scared me to death. And uh, we didn't leave it just laying there. He took it into the, our apartment and uh, skinned it, and I think we still have that skin at home, and he shows the kids and the grandkids that this was a snake that scared uh, uh, Mom to death and Grandma Rita to death. <laughs> but times were different in those days. It wasn't like it was now where uh, we didn't have a car or anything, and you, did, you just walked. And uh, it was a very special time, and but I was sure glad when he come home from overseas. That was special, and um, glad those days are behind us. And Jack did not tell, but in La Habra, we bought just a um, a land, just a bare land, and he built by himself. A, a beautiful big bed uh, home. Then when we moved north 20 years ago, we got 20 acres right in the tops of the mountains, 40 miles west of Redding. And uh, I thought, how is he going to make something nice and pretty that I really would like to live in and entertain because my home in Brea was lovely, really nice and beautiful. And he says, well, now, if I can't do something nice for you, Rita, we'll just sell it and get rid of it. Well, we bought 20 acres right in the middle of the tops of the mountains, tops of the uh, pine trees and fir trees, and it, our front looks clear off by the Trinity Alps, which they're pure white part of the time. It's a three-story three, uh, house. We live on the second story, and uh, he did everything. He did all the tile work. He, did, he just built the whole thing, and uh, we burn wood there. We have our big fireplaces and and um, so those are some of the things that you work together and I think that is something that's made Jack and I happy. We've gone to, always gone to church together. We've taken our kids to church and um, I think that's very important to keep a couple happy and in love. Yeah. Well that's awesome man. We appreciate that. Thank you. I just remembered one story. <clears throat> In the 12th Armored Division, if you read very much about it or see the emblems the men have on their uh, belt buckles, uh, things it will talk about the Mystery Division. And um, the Mystery Division was where if they were loaned to another section of the uh, 12th Armored Division or with any other group, all the insignias had to be taken off, all things, no letter writing could go to the states. Everything was held up for 30 days. And if that was the end of it, then it, everything could start over again. But that wasn't the end of this one time. They held everything up for uh, 30 days. Then they were trans to a, another whole section. Then those uh, emblems and their patches were all taken off. There'd be a whole another 30 days. Then they did it again. So there was three different times that, uh, and then we wrote every single day. Our letters were all held up. We still wrote, but he never got any of mine. I never got any of his, but I did not know anything about this. This was a mystery to everybody. Why we didn't get letters and why we didn't get, I didn't get a message that from the government that he was missing in action. I just, all letters just stopped. Well, I was, a lot of older ladies would say, well, what do you hear about J from Jack? And I'd say, I haven't heard for months. 
and they'd say, well, why is he doing that? Well, I didn't know. But um, all of a sudden, one day, the mailman come to, I lived out in a rural area, and the mailman come and he knocked on the door and he says, does Rita Winter live here? And my mother says, yes. And he said, would you call her? And he says, I've got something for her. So he brought this big mail bag, great big, huge filled, filled almost to the top because of writing every day, there was many, many letters in there. And he dumped that all one day on our kitchen table and uh, there I had all those letters. I knew he was, then it was publicized, um, what had been happening over in Europe. And that was where the 12th Armored Division picked up the, uh, be the mystery division. They are, as far as I know, the only mystery division in uh, the war days. And that was what I went through. And it really was a, a sad thing. I mean, <laughs> to me, I didn't know if he was dead. I didn't know if he was alive. But when I got all those letters, that was a thrill that day. That's, that's cool. That's awesome. Yeah, they, uh, Milton does a lot of stuff like that sometimes, holding, holding things up. Well, see, these days when the fellows are in service, just about any place, telephone calling can go back and forth. And um, lots of times the girls can go stay with the husbands. And, uh, but during World War II, it was not that way. And uh, so any of those little exciting things really just didn't make me happy. My folks were happy for me because I was living with them.